All right, so we're going to start to look at modern macroeconomics and in particular new classical macroeconomics. New classical macroeconomics is really a broad umbrella name for a bunch of different theories, but a lot of these theories cover very similar ideas or they pull from similar approaches. So overall new classical macro, what is this similar foundation that they all pull from? It's a school of thought that builds its analysis on the neoclassical or standard microeconomic toolkit. Right? So what you would find in a principles of microeconomics or an intermediate microeconomic uh, textbook would be the foundation for new classical macroeconomics. New classical macro emphasizes important micro foundations, in particular, rational expectations theory. The micro foundations that new classical macro builds off of has a supply and demand equilibrium and efficiency outcome that results from the actions of economically rational households and firms. The actions are at the base of what is to be analyzed or at the genesis of the macro analysis, right? So the genesis of the macro indicators like GDP are these micro foundations, right? And so macro indicators like GDP are the result of general equilibrium microeconomic markets in the economy. In new classical macro, market efficiency or markets clearing is a major emphasis. So for example, some new classical macroeconomists even reject the very notion of cyclical involuntary unemployment. Employment, like output, still rises with favorable shocks and falls with unfavorable shocks. But then we could ask, well, why then do new classicals think that the unemployment rate would fall and rise in a boom and in a bust, right? When we're slumping, why is unemployment rising? Well, the new classical explanation for unemployment then could, is sometimes put forward as, well, when a worker is laid off, she must find a new job. And so she weighs the value of taking a lower paying job that might be easily available, right? Uh, so a machinist might become a day laborer or something against the long run value of a better paid job, a more suitable job, but a job that's harder to find. The new classicals do not argue that the unemployed job searcher is somehow happy with this choice, right? Being laid off was a bad draw, and like everyone, she prefers good luck to bad luck. But rather, they're arguing that the worker voluntarily chooses what she regards as the best available long-run option, even when the options are poor. Now, this might involve a big cost now, but it prevents future costs later or a lower career trajectory. To remain unemployed and to show up in the unemployment statistics is something that she chooses based on her judgment that the benefits of the search outweigh the cost. New classical macro also importantly builds rational expectations into its micro foundations. This is in the tradition following Lo the Lucas critique. The Phillips curve trade-off can be observed in the data because some part of the policy is always unanticipated. So we still see some Phillips curve results, but that's only because some policy is completely unanticipated and there's some kind of random noise there. So we're still building rational expectations into our model here. Policymakers cannot exploit, however, the Phillips curve because the public will see through any systematic policy that they are actually following. Because it rejected the prevailing Keynesian view that monetary policy could offset a recession, this new classical macro emphasis on rational expectations is sometimes referred to as the policy ineffectiveness proposition. Right? This became the most startling and controversial conclusion of the early new classical macro, that we could not have policy that was actually exploitable by our policymakers, because if we have any kind of game plan, individuals are going to see right through it. They're gonna have rational expectations and it's not gonna do anything such as in this case, if we were trying to uh, inflate the money supply to expand the economy and reduce unemployment, well, we'd have rational expectations and all that we would get would be inflation.
So the Phillips curve trade-off still can be observed in the data some, but that's just because some policy happens where it's very unanticipated and it's just kind of random noise. But if we're actually trying to systematically take advantage of some kind of Keynesian activist policy, what the new classical macro is arguing is that there is a policy ineffectiveness proposition. There's, they're arguing that we'll have rational expectations and all we'll get from expansionary monetary policy if it's some kind of game plan by the policymakers is purely inflation. Most new classical theory categorically rejects Keynesian economics and the real effectiveness of discretionary monetary policy. As even monetary policy is promoted by monetarism, new Keynesians, and the, Keynes the original Keynesian activist monetary policy advocates. In his book, the undercover economist strikes back. Tim Harford presents new classical macroeconomics in certain ways. And in particular, he really focuses on what's called real business cycle theory. According to the new classicals in Harford's book, there's two things that cause recessions. One, bad policy, right? So we could have bad government intervention, bad policy that causes problems for an economy. And two, exogenous shocks right? Exogenous shocks are unpredictable changes in exogenous or outside factors, right? So you could consider how well your car is operating based on what types of maintenance and care you put into that car. But then one day your car gets struck by uh, a tree that falls from, from a, you know, lightning striking the tree and the tree smashes down on your car while it's just sitting in your driveway. You're not even driving it around. The car getting smashed by the tree could be considered an exogenous factor that will impact how well your car is operating. It is an unforeseen factor that impacts your car's operations, but it's not from your standard car maintenance or something from within your model of, okay, well, how well am I treating my car and how well is it running, right? So you have these exogenous shocks. In the real world, to leave our metaphor, you can think of exogenous shocks coming from technology shocks or natural disasters or a pandemic, a resource shock such as the 1973 oil crisis, a terrorist attack, other countries changing their policies or their wealth in drastic fashion, right? So think of the rise of China in the late 20th century. That's an exogenous shock to other economies. You can think of a stock market crash as an exog exogenous shock here. There's demand shocks from consumer confidence. There's all kinds of things that could happen to the model and kind of shock the system of your economy. And so Harford talks about this in this chapter uh, where he talks about what's, what he calls the prison camp recession or the prisoner of war camp recession. And so what he does is he discusses this idea in, in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, there actually was a, an, a famous article uh, that was written in economics. And this article was written by a guy named Robert Radford. And what he did is he described that an economy actually emerged within the prisoner of war camp uh, that he was in. And so he saw kind of what happened in that little experimental economy. And he s described in some places that there were these exogenous shocks that happened. Right. Um, so the economy he put forward, they used cigarettes as cash. There were parcels of food and other rations that were consumable goods. There was little production, but there was some and everyone kind of got the same stuff, but not everybody wanted the same stuff. So there was trade and exchange going on and some markets arose, but sometimes supplies came in abundance. In other times they were severely lacking. Right. This was not from the production decisions of the individuals in that economy. It was exogenous deliveries of goods. Right. And so we wanted to think about how these exogenous shocks really impacted the economy that we were in. Right. And so Harford says, you know, that's one metaphor for what ha can happen to a macro economy is it can be jolted around by exogenous shocks. Right. And so we have these kind of you know, natural disasters or pandemics like we experienced in 2020 or resource problems like we see with the 1973, uh, you know, oil crisis that's going on. That's one type of crisis that can happen for an economy. And this is very much so in contrast to Harford's other example, uh, what he calls the babysitting recessions. 
right? And so this comes from Paul Krugman, who made kind of popular this analogy of a babysitting recession, where there was this babysitting co-op, a bunch of people who are going to kind of share babysitting duties that used scripts or little pieces of kind of like IOUs for the ability to kind of go out on, on the town, you know, for one night and have somebody else babysit your kids. Well, the idea was that, hey, everybody gets these scripts and, and people will use them to go out and, and you know, go, go out on a date or just hang out or get some extra work done or whatever it was, but use them to get babysitting services. The problem was that these were so highly valued by individuals for the, you know, potential what if, you know, something happens and we need to use our scripts that no one used any of their scripts. No one paid for babysitting services. There was, in that case, a failure of demand, right? So people weren't purchasing anything. Whereas in the prisoner of war recession, there was often failures of supply instead, right? There was no, no resources around, none of the goods were there, right? And so we have these two different things that we can kind of contrast here. And what new classical macro is really gonna focus on is emphasizing that now we need to start looking at these supply side shocks. Right? We had done Keynesian economics and it was so aggregate demand focused that we kind of ignored the idea of supply side shocks. But the 1970s showed us that recessions weren't just Keynesian babysitting recessions. Right, So there was plenty of money to go around. There was high inflation along with our high in un unemployment. So the 1970s showed us macroeconomic problems with supply and not with demand. Let's show this graphically. All right, so here we have a depiction of our economy working normally within our aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. But then what we say is we could say, okay, imagine that you have a long run aggregate supply negative shock, right? So we have a negative shock to our long run ability to produce within our country. When we do this, the short run aggregate supply curve moves with the long run aggregate supply. Production is now lower. Our real GDP growth rate has dropped from 3% growth rate to a negative 2% growth rate. So this has dropped. And we also have a higher price level. We're now from pr at price level one, we've moved up to price level two. If we bump aggregate demand out at this point, we're still going to have a lower growth rate. If that short run aggregate supply curve is very steep at all past our long run aggregate supply, which a lot of people assume that it is, we're not really going to boost our growth rate very much at all, right? So in this case, our growth rate is still negative uh, 1%, which is lower than our original 3%. Sure, it's better than negative 2%, but we haven't bumped things up very much by boosting aggregate demand, right? So we're still gonna have unemployment. When we compare our situation to the original pre-shock equilibrium, we also have higher inflation as well. To make things even worse, if you do this policy where you boost aggregate demand out and long run aggregate supply has gone back, you should note that prices quickly adjust in the upward direction. So our short run aggregate supply curve will shift back once more and then we end up at price level four and nothing but inflation has been created as we're still at the output level of that negative 2% real GDP growth rate. We're not really fixing any issues by manipulating aggregate demand. We're not fixing any issues of output by boosting aggregate demand. This is a recession that has worries about supply and not demand. So we can see from this example, from this modeling here, that all recessions are not Keynesian or babysitting recessions. For the next in this series, click on the video here and you'll find out more about new classical macroeconomics.